Welcome to Lydia Finette's Claim Your Confidence, a podcast that will introduce you to the most powerful women in the world as they talk about their own confidence journey. No matter what obstacles you face, Claim Your Confidence will inspire you, motivate you, and give you a roadmap to live the life you want. So, are you ready to claim your confidence? Hi, everyone, and welcome to Claim Your Confidence. I'm Lydia Finette, and I am so delighted that you're joining me again today. I'm thrilled to introduce you to the guest who's sitting in front of me right now in Rockefeller Center. Huma Abedin is here with us. Hi, Huma. Hi, Lydia. I'm so excited to be on this podcast. We're going to have a great time. So thank you for making your way into the crazy Rockefeller Center of the Christmas the season. Fish bowl. The fishbowl <laughs> of Rockefeller Center. So I want to talk a little bit about you to start. Huma has spent her entire career in public service and national politics, beginning as an intern in First Lady Hillary Clinton's office in 1996. She worked in the U.S. Senate as senior advisor to Senator Clinton and was traveling chief of staff for Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign. In 2009, she was appointed deputy chief of staff at the U.S. Department of State. She served as the vice chair of Hillary for America in 2016, resulting in the first woman elected nominee of a major political party. She currently serves as Hillary Clinton's chief of staff. Huma, I want to tell a little story about how I first came to read your book, which I want to talk about a lot during the podcast today, which is called Both And. I had a terrible accident, which I think probably many people listening to this podcast will know about in 2021. And at the time, you were on book tour for your book, and I was invited to a book signing. I mentioned to the host that I wasn't going to be able to come, and as a result, she sent me your book which because I was in basically in bed because of a spinal fusion, I read over the course of about a month, I would read it in pages at night. It's such a beautifully written book, so eloquent, and your entire life story is so compelling and interesting. I want to dive right in and talk a little bit about your childhood, which is so extraordinary because you grew up in Michigan until the age of two. And then what happened? Well, um, first of all, I think that um, just sharing, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book was because I think it's so important for people to write and share their stories and make those connections. And just the fact that you tell that story of reading my book while you were, I mean, talk about somebody who has experienced trauma and resilience. It's, I mean, a big part of the reason I wrote the book is because a lot of people say to me, how do you, how do you get up every day and face the world with such hope and positivity when you've had so many challenges in your life. And I always say, and I, we talked about this a little bit, Lydia, when we had dinner a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, but that um, really if you get up every single day and you have your health. It's a huge thing. Kind of everything else is really B, C, D, and the rest. Yeah. And um, so I, I sit here in a tremendous amount of admiration for you okay. that you have you know, you're a badass in your own right in so many different ways, professionally and personally, but to have overcome what you have overcame and to sit here, um, I'm just thrilled. Anyway, so th- it's connected to my story because um, when I was two, you know, my parents were immigrants, mm-hmm. um, uh, met at a uh, university. Uh, they were both Fulbright scholars, fell in love, moved to Michigan. Um, and when I was two, my dad was diagnosed with renal failure. And he was told he had, and he was my age. He was actually 40, well, he was 46, so a year younger than me. It's wild when you think about you, that in your own yes, life. Yes, I do yeah. that a lot. When I think about it, I was like, he was actually my age and he, essentially my age, and he was told you have, you know, a progressive renal failure and you have five to 10 years. So yeah. get your affairs in order. Um, and I was two, my sister was four, and my brother was uh, seven. And... My mother, you know, hears the news, totally shocked and passes out in the hospital. My Mm -hmm. father basically thanks the doctor for his time and goes out into the waiting room and collects all of us. And it's the first line I wrote when I sat to write the book. It's one of the very first lines I wrote. My father was told he was dying. So he went out and he lived. Yeah, I remember reading that. Yeah, and um, he uh, chose this to take the sabbatical to Saudi Arabia. Two months later, we left and moved to this new country. We didn't speak the language. We didn't know the culture. My mother, in fact, tells the story of the very first question she asked my dad was, are there even diapers in Saudi Arabia? (laughs) It's like 1977. 
Um, he probably said, I don't actually have an answer for that <laughs> and question. And he didn't. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously yeah. pre-Google, pre-anything. We didn't know anybody there. We had some friends, you know, they had some friends there. Um, but they took us on this great adventure. I mean, that's essentially the the great privilege of living in that part of the world. Number one is we were exposed to a whole different culture. That was part of, we were a Muslim family. So it was connecting us to our faith tradition, but yeah. also people from all over the world. And every summer we traveled to different places. And my parents were very insistent that we learn and explore different countries and cultures. And that's, and that's what we did. It's so amazing because, and I shared this when I met you, that mm. I had the opportunity to go to Jeddah where yes. you grew up. And I remember you said, wait, why did you go there? Yeah. And I went to take an auction. And it is such a different mm. country. And yet the interesting thing, which I always find about traveling is that ultimately people are still the same. Right. You know, when I stood on the stage in Jeddah, people reacted in the same way that they do when I take auctions in New mm. York. And it was such an amazing reminder that I always try to think about whenever I'm traveling. Humans are human. Mm. People are people. And you are living in these two different lives. So you would, st you would still come back to Michigan, Michigan. You would come back to Queens. I know you said this in the book for summers. And mm. so what did that feel like as a young child, especially as a young girl? Did you notice cultural differences or were, was that something that you consciously noticed over time or it was sort of an evolution of thought? Um, you know, nobody's asked me this question. It's mm -hmm. funny. I've been in, uh, in the book tour for a year, and the question and the answer is yes. I mean, I, I knew sort of. I, in some ways, my life was kind of compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. First of all, my parents raised my brother and my sister. You know, there's four of us. My mm -hmm. sisters and I is totally equal. You know, yeah. I didn't. I didn't in my house. I didn't feel like there wasn't anything I can do. Couldn't yeah. do rather. And my parents, they you know, they only had one condition: be educated. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, you can do whatever you wanted to do. And so as maybe as the middle child, because I was the third of four, I was, I was, you know, my, my brother was, you know, the strong, smart, like he was going to go off and be the son who kind of took care of the family. And my older sister was the brilliant one. She went on to become a medical doctor. So I was like, I was the comedian. I was the performer. I was the one who got up and, you know, uh, read my poetry or dance. Or <laughs> like, I just, I loved, you know, being creative. And I, you know, my father always told me I would be a writer and, and he in the end was right because yes. I did write my you book. You did, there you are. Um, but I did know it was a very constricted life. Like, yeah. for example, I know that I consciously remember that I loved gymnastics and I loved ballet, mm -hmm. but they didn't have ballet. There were no gyms in Saudi right. Arabia. There were no movie theaters. You know, you, it was a it was a very um, um, uh, segregated environment, and yeah. so uh, gymnastics existed until I was, I think, eight actually. And so this thing that I loved, this movement, this physical, and I was good at it, and I was flexible, and I felt really empowered. I, it was taken away from me when Didn't I was eight. That. Yeah, but simultaneously, I think the reason, you know, unlike a lot of my girlfriends who lived in Saudi Arabia, um, I always knew that I would get on a plane in May, June. And I was off on some grand adventure and to the point that you were making, what I was discovering was, yeah, people everywhere are kind of the same. And yeah. we had tea ceremonies in Saudi Arabia. Get, but guess what? They have tea ceremonies in China and in Japan and in India and in the United Kingdom. Like there, there are so many, you know, even cultural traditions. Uh, that were similar. And I think because I had that window and that freedom and that capacity to explore, it gave me this sense of, you know, to use a word that really is a word you've coined, is really that confidence that I could be who I am. Yeah. But also explore the other. Yeah. It's so amazing to think about moving between those worlds at mm. that young age because you have that awareness, you know there's something different, which fundamentally I think a lot of people don't even realize until they're much older, that mm. they're completely different yeah. worlds taking place, different societies, different cultures. And if you've only seen one thing, it's the only thing you know. That's right. So it's such a gift that you saw that. Yeah. I have a British mother, so she always says to me, she said, it's not bad or good, Lydia. If, if someone says something differently, it's just different. Mm hmm and I truly think about that all the time. It's not bad or good. I think yeah. about that even as men and women, when people say, well, you're a female auctioneer, like that's better. It's not better, it's just different. Yeah, and I think right? it's a great way to look at life. I love I the stories you tell about your father and especially when it comes to confidence. Mm -hmm. And there's a great story that you tell about what he used to tell you mm -hmm. to do when you were little to sort of push you out of your comfort yeah. zone. One of them, which was my favorite was, Go call the airline. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But right. tell us more about your father and confidence yeah, and what yeah. he did to imbue that in you. Yeah. Well, I've um, I very rarely get to share the story because it. I mean, it is a it is it is a long book. But um, you know, my father, uh, who grew up in India and was an avid sportsman, 
Uh, I, I share the story in the book. It's a short version of the story where when he was um, graduating from university and he was an equestrian, he ran for the riding club. He was thrown from his horse as as his horse was trying to jump over a fence and he, and, and he fell and he hit his back and he hurt. He was very badly hurt. And he was the only boy, you know, his, his parents had other boys um, and none of them had survived. So he was only surviving son in his family. He only had sisters. And so here he is at 21. He's thrown off this horse. He's in excruciating pain. And he doesn't tell anybody. Doesn't tell, certainly doesn't send word back to his family. And only after seven days with his classmates noticing that he was essentially crawling up the stairs oh to attend classes God. at school, that they were like, there's something really wrong with you. And they picked him up, took him to the doctor. And the doctor's like, well, you have a broken back. Oh my gosh. And he then had to take a year off and was forced to like, back then you'd be on these sandbags. That's the only way you sort of healed your, you know, your, your spine. And that's when he would write and do his poetry. And I, but I tell the story about my father because it, it explains who the human was who raised me. Right. <laughs> that this notion of you can overcome and you can be, and he went on to, you know, have this extraordinary life. And, you know, I thought it was a gift to the world. And that's how he raised us. And, you know, so first and foremost, my, you know, my father was ill. They didn't tell us. Yeah. It was a secret in my household that my father was essentially terminally ill. You know, when you're a kid, normal's normal. So, right. you know, having a father who's 100 pounds and, you know, has to go for, to a lot of doctor's visits, you know, that's just normal to you. Having a mother who's basically super mom, who does all the cooking, all the cleaning, also works full time also carries all the children because my father literally couldn't Could carry us. He up. didn't have the strength to do that. And so I think it was a combination of he didn't know how long he had left. And so he wanted to teach us as much as possible. But secondly, it was a way for us to spend time together yeah. and show us how to live without him. Yeah. And and that's why we, there are these stories where I share that I was eight, nine years old and my father would say, all right, where do you guys want to go this year? We'd say Asia. It's like, okay, you call the airlines <laughs> and figure out if we can get from Bangkok to Jakarta. And I would shake yeah. or you'd have like, academics like scholars come visiting from all over the world. And he would say, go, go down the hallway. And we had this tiny little, you know, two bedroom apartment, go down the hallway and, you know, talk to the guests about, you know, your poetry and your studies. And I would shake, I would shake having to walk down there speaking to adults. But what I found over time is that I felt very comfortable doing it. And to that, you know, going back to that word, it's like I, I had this innate confidence mm -hmm. in who I was, what I believed in, and 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 no one ever laughed at it. And I think I think that's a very big thing, especially for children, to not dismiss their opinions, not sort of you know, sort of be flippant about it. And I and I think that really gave me a sense of um, of real assuredness in who I was and what I wanted to do in this world. And such a gift because gift, yes. you realize as a child that if you can do something, you're never going to ask anyone else to do it again, right? And then ultimately you live so an independent life, which truly is what you're raising your children to do if you're yeah. parenting them correctly, yeah. right? It's to live a life that they own and yeah. have ownership over. You lost your father when you were 17 yeah. and you were so candid in the book about that. I cried actually when I read it, it was such a touching mm. moment. And during that time and after that time, you'd been accepted into college in the US, is that mm. correct? Yes. And so tell us what happens next. You know, losing my father, even though, you know, he did survive long enough, you know, got, he was on dialysis and got a tr kidney transplant. So instead of, you know, losing him when I was 10, I lost him when I was 17. There's a big, big, big difference yeah. between you know, losing a parent when you're 10 and losing them when you're 17. And I do think, speaking of gift, I do think it was the gift that I was able to spend At those time. formative years um, with him. Having said that, it still was devastating. I mean, you know, it's always devastating no matter how old you are when you lose your parent. But one of the things that it did to me is it took something away from me. I mean, I, had, I was in such trauma. Um, I was in such almost disbelief. And it's why... Um, I share the story of going to university and I, in fact, decided not to go to school. I was so shaken by his loss. I actually wasn't sure I could go out in the world and be successful without him. Um, and that for years, I didn't tell anybody that my father wasn't alive. I, really? couldn't, I couldn't. You couldn't bring I yourself actually couldn't to say the say words. It. I couldn't say the words. Yeah. Um, and I also kind of a little bit retreated into a shell. Yeah. Um, when you know, I started working at the White House in 1996, I remember I would have friends from Saudi Arabia who would come to the White House, or friends from college even, would come to the White House, um, 
from the White House, and um, and they were like, oh my God, isn't she like the craziest, loudest? And I was like, well, no, she doesn't talk very much. She's very quiet. And it really had, you know, I had to consciously, I mean, this is so cliche, but I really had to consciously, you know, find my voice again yeah. and step up. But that, you know, and I and now I'm raising a 10 year old. We've talked about raising, you know, children in Manhattan. But I think in part because I grew up in a culture where you didn't talk about your problems, particularly to strangers. So there was certainly no therapy. We didn't go to therapy when my father had his transplant. We certainly mm -hmm. didn't, you know, you don't, oh my goodness, how could you talk? It's so shameful. But I could have probably used it, yeah, you know, course. in real time. Yeah. And when I was 17, 18, 19, and I m found my way back yeah. to myself. But it took, a, it, it took a little time. Did you like coming to America for college, even though that was a very difficult time in your life? Did you enjoy being here in, in a completely different society yes. at that time? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I always, my parents, because my parents came from two countries that were at war. Yeah. It's how we ended up here. Yeah. You know, my father was Indian. My mother was from Pakistan. And so back, uh, frankly, you can argue even now, but certainly back in the 60s, you could not go to either country as a married couple and live peacefully because it was just fraught with tension yeah. on either side yeah um and uh so that's how they got asylum here yeah. um and so my parents knew they couldn't say you were this or that um and so they always said you are american and you're muslim and that you know we were raised to respect and honor both countries and cultures pakistani and indian but my identity was as an american and i i say this even now to a lot of my american friends it, it felt like a great privilege to be an American, you know, yeah. carrying that blue passport, traveling around the world, because it meant something. It represented something, certainly in the 80s and the 90s. I mean, you know, with Reagan. I mean, it was just like this, we were this great superpower in the world, uh, uh, kind of leading the way. And I, I always carried that affection for this country. And I always said first that I was American. So no, it was, in some ways it was, even though I had never lived here. Yeah. Moving here in that fall of 93 after I lost my dad was in some ways coming home. Right, right. Well, you started out here, yes. right? At the age yes. of two. I mean, you were here for the first two years of your life. So yeah. you are as American as anyone else. Yes. That's the truth, That's right? right? That's right. And so you were in college when you first started interning at the White House. But that's not a story that most people have. So how did that internship come about? And Obviously, you were incredibly well-read. You talk about this a lot in the book, about how much you were reading as a child in different cultures, different stories of different people, and how that was such a crux of your family and your childhood. But what led you to politics in America? How did the White House become part of your story? Totally by accident. Um, and best, I, The best things the best often thing do. do, right? <laughs> it's a combination of fate, luck, and hard work. Yeah. Um, I, re I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be specifically Christiana Amanpour, I'd seen her on TV. Oh, she is amazing. I mean, she's extraordinary. Yeah. And especially as a, you know, for a 16, 15 year old girl, you know, sitting on the floor of her living room and watching this, you know, this vision appear. And back then it was, um, you know, it was Operation Desert Storm. It was right after Saddam Hussein sure. and the president of Iraq um, invaded uh, neighboring Kuwait. And this whole coalition of allied forces uh, came in to repel uh, the Iraqi troops. And she was reporting from the front lines. From the front lines. Absolutely. I mean, it was, and I had never, and you know how we've talked about, this. sometimes you have to see something to believe it's possible yeah. for yourself. And, Absolutely. And modeling uh, kind of that, um, profession that and but to me it wasn't even it was a calling it was like i just want to be her yeah she just seemed like this confident truth-telling intrepid brilliant uh, human being and so i had a friend um who was a year ahead of me uh, at college i went to uh, george washington university to study journalism specifically so that i could become christian <laughs> and uh, she says i'm interning for mike mccurry who was then the white house press secretary and uh and she said uh, you should apply for an internship and i did uh, but I was not placed in the office of the <laughs> White House press secretary. Given my background, my work, we've talked a lot about my father, but my mother was a women's um, rights activist and, you know, champion for, you know, frankly, women's education and equality and, and reproductive rights. Um, and so they placed me in the first lady's policy office. And I share the story of calling my mother. I was actually disappointed and calling my mother from those old one of those old brick cell phones. Yes, I remember those. <laughs> oh my goodness, saying, Mom, I can't believe it. I didn't, you know, how am I gonna become Christian I'm on poor if I don't work for Mike McCurry? And she says, Yeah, <laughs> sometimes plan A doesn't work out. Probably something your mother would say to you. Yeah. But you know, plan B might work out okay. And boy, did it ever. That's just it just kind of 
took off. And then I sort of just fell in love with government service and public service. It did feel like a calling uh, and then politics. So and so it, it's such an intoxicating it is. time. Yeah, I it have was. to know before we move on, though, yeah. did you ever meet Christian Amanpour? <laughs> I met Christian Amanpour. She actually came to the White House first. She was at the time. So Jamie Rubin, her uh, now ex-husband, Jamie Rubin was the spokesperson for the State Department. And they were this sort of, this glamorous, dashing couple back then. <laughs> I mean, it was, there were like a few, it was um, actually JFK Jr. and Carolyn Bissett Kennedy were the others. So like there was, there were these few kind of, you know, it couples, power that, couples. Power couples <laughs> yeah. that would come to the White House. And I remember the first time I saw her with uh, Jamie, they came to an event and I, um, Lydia, I couldn't, speak. I, I, couldn't <laughs> I couldn't even speak. Okay, I just so stared old. at her. I just stared at her and didn't even introduce, I don't even think I introduced myself to her the very first time. I saw her at the White House, but I have met her a few times subsequently. And, you know, she's such a professional. She actually interviewed me for the book um, that she's just, you know, she's very polite and kind. But, you know, it's know. like, do you know you like changed that? my life? And she's like, well, this is wonderful. Let me ask you about this, you know. She probably asked you how you got into politics. And you said, well, it's so interesting because it was you. you. It was actually <laughs> you were the reason. That's I have so told her that. But I'm, uh, I'm lucky to have had a, a role model uh, like that in my life. And uh, she's really extraordinary. Well, speaking of role models, obviously, the other person you ended up working for mm -hmm. and ultimately have worked for ever since is obviously a huge role model for so many people. Mm -hmm. So you worked for the First Lady in that capacity. Yeah. And then how did your career progress from there? Where did you go when her tenure ended there? Well, you know, it was a rocky beginning mm -hmm. uh, because to the point we were having earlier, I mean, I was really, I had, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. They kind of throw you off the deep end. And I certainly made many mistakes. And, you know, I share stories in the book about losing her clothes in the East River, about <laughs> she goes to a speech and, you know, it's my first time and I put the wrong speech on stage. And, <laughs> And I really, and that, and it's funny because I try to think of like where I had to dig deep. Here I am, this 22 year old, 23 year old in a world. I mean, it, and, and it's not just a world, it's like power on yeah, steroids. Exactly. It's not just a world, it's a world stage. It's, it's like in fact. the most powerful man and woman on the planet. And you are meant to, you know, be there to support them. And there were, um, yeah, there were a few uh, close calls there. Where I thought, oh my gosh, my gosh, I'm going to be fired. But I just had something inside of me that thought, you know, even though I knew I wasn't the best, mm -hmm. I wasn't the smartest, I wasn't the prettiest, I wasn't the ist anything ever in my life. I, I'm sitting but, across from you now and I find that okay, so no, hard to believe. True, but I, but I understand what you're you saying. Get I get it. Yeah, I get it. Um, but I, I knew I was prepared to outwork everybody. Like I just, yeah. I knew ever since I was little, and maybe this is something that gets inculcated in us when we're children, mm -hmm. I just knew my life was gonna be different. Yeah. I just felt it. I didn't know how. Yeah. I didn't know what it was gonna be. I just felt my life was gonna be different. And boy, I mean, did that prove to be true. And so when they left the White House, I made a, uh, and Hillary had run uh, for the United States Senate, first first lady to do that. She obviously wins, um, the Senator representing New York. And I made a promise to myself, said the day that I wake up and I don't wanna, go in, that I don't want to go to work. I don't want to get on that plane to Albany or wherever we were going or Iraq or Afghanistan, which is how we spent many of those Senate years, is the day that I was going to give notice. Yeah. Um, that I needed that, that first of all, that challenge every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the excitement, but it did feel like every day I was learning something new and different. Yeah. Um, and probably putting to use so many things that you learned throughout your life. A hundred percent. You know, everything you knew, 100%. All the travel that you had done as a child, you know, the education that you'd had from your parents, all of those things are perfectly set for that job and that role. hundred percent. And you know, Lydia, it's one of the reasons I wrote the early part of my story in the book, because I really, I have spoken since the book has been out to a lot of women, particularly women of color, who will say, you know, I didn't feel like when I walked into that boardroom and I was the only woman of color, mm -hmm. I feel insecure. I feel, and I didn't have that. You know, mm -hmm. I would walk in and say, you know, I'm different and I know what I bring and I'm really proud of what I know that's different from the rest of you. Yeah. So I share the stories of going on these congressional delegations on these military aircrafts with, you know, then Senator John, the late Senator John McCain and other Republican senators and Democratic senators and Hillary saying, tell them about Iraq, tell them about, you know, just giving the cultural context. I mean, I just brought a different, I, I frankly brought a different perspective to the table, a different yeah. perspective to the, the sort of these diplomatic conversations because we often view, and I put myself in that we, 
you know, the broader world from this very Western perspective. It's yeah. like, try to put yourself us in, versus them, right? Isn't that the exactly problem? Right. That's what we run into. Put, put exactly right. So put ourselves in their shoes. And yeah. what does that feel like? Yeah. And for me, I have for my entire life, I've been able to do that. And that's why I constantly throughout the book share stories, whether it was the Senate or the State Department, we'd go particularly the Middle East or Asia or South Asia, and they wouldn't know, wait, are you American or are you Saudi? Are you, you know, mm -hmm. talk about going back to Saudi Arabia and being introduced to the king. At the time, it was King Abdullah, who's now passed away. And, um, and the ambassador, the Saudi ambassador calls me over and says, your majesty, I want you to introduce you to you know, Huma Abedin, she's bint al-Balad, a daughter of the country, uh -huh. you know, and, and, and that's, the conne that's the connection they made. And I'm totally comfortable, you know, yeah. being the American there, but also making, you know, that connection. Because you are, that's who you are. Right. You know, I yeah. love, again, both and, right? A life in many worlds. A life in many worlds, <laughs> absolutely. So talk to me a little bit about when you met your ex-husband, because yeah. that's definitely another part of your story. Oh, yeah. And you said when we had dinner that night, mm. we, Huma and I sat next to each other at the Child Mind Institute dinner. And to be fair, I had already DM'd her over Instagram to ask her to be on this <laughs> podcast, but it was just fate that I ended up yeah. sitting next to her that evening and could ask her again. Um, but I, I think so often in your book, you said it was such a long book and that you'd had to edit it down so many times, yeah. but there's so many different moments in your life where... I think, and look at you as someone who mm. were similar ages, our first children are the same age, where you have handled so many situations, both in your professional life and your personal life, with such grace and courage and such confidence, and you keep coming back and doing more and going through more. And mm. I think the story of your ex-husband in the book is starts as a love story, a very mm. sweet love story. And that's where you want to always believe that love begins at the yes. beginning. So tell us a little bit about yes. that. Yes, so I'm so glad you asked me about it. And maybe because I really am at in this moment, at such a place in my life where I have come to the other side yeah. um, with Anthony. And um, I am so grateful to have had that love. And, and, and people are shocked who don't know me when I say that. Uh, first of all, one of the, the sort of small um, kind of services I feel like I have done through this book, I do not go, and this is not an exaggeration, more than a few days without somebody, a woman stopping me, usually a woman, not always, but usually a woman stopping me on the street to share a very similar story. That yeah. this notion of being in a relationship with your partner, whether it's your husband, your lover, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whatever, without challenges. Of course. And without, you know, doubt or without betrayal or without something um but i want to come back to the core of one of the things i'm so grateful of, about 12 years later um and i've known anthony for a lot more longer than that is that i know what it does feel like to be loved yeah. and that is such a gift that i when i was with my husband uh or you know before we were married even i was with a man who every day told me that I was beautiful, yeah. that I was brilliant, who helped me write, you know, if I needed help with talking points, if I needed to run something by him, to feel adored and to feel part of a partnership where you're respected. Um, it's only now when I'm out of that and dating other people that you realize, oh my God, like what I had was really special. Like, and I, I don't want anything to take away from that. Yeah. Like we would go to dinners and, and Anthony would say, oh, talk to my wife about Afghanistan. She's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And for a lot of, I mean, I don't mean to sort of put men in a category, but for a lot of men, that is hard. It's hard to be yeah. in a partnership where you live to partner up. So I, I start there, but also, and it was so much fun. And I mean, it was just everything about being with him made, you know, me feel alive and, and, um, and just confident. And I think that's wonderful to have. Now, yeah. of course, very quickly, <laughs> You know, we went from our Camelot phase, if you will, um, but mostly because I didn't understand anything. I came from such a conservative society. I mm -hmm. share in the book that, you know, I lost my virginity to Anthony. Yeah. I, you know, this is just where I came from is that you say I yeah. waited for the perfect man. He was it. I yeah. was going to get married and he was going to be the only person I was intimate with in that way and certainly in a physical way. And um, uh, so I, you know, this idea of, all of a sudden waking up to this I, notion that, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all these messages from these women that 
you know, uh, he was engaging. I didn't understand. I didn't know what addiction was. In fact, nobody really knew what was happening with Anthony. It was here you had this man who was going to be the next mayor of New York. He was mm-hmm. so dynamic. He was a really, you know, popular, successful congressman. Why do you constantly engage in behavior that, frankly, is self-destructive? Yeah. yeah. And the first time it happened, um, and I think as you, you shared, we have, I mean, I was newly pregnant. Yeah. And to me, you know, that motherhood, that mother kind of, whatever it is, that kicked in right away. And the first thing that came to my mind is I could not control when I was going to lose my dad. Yeah. And I was going to do everything I could to ensure that this child inside of me had a chance at having a father in his life. Yeah. Yeah. And I stayed and I was, boy, was I vilified yeah. for staying. And I stayed over and over again. And in part because of all the other, you know, I never knew that Anthony because all I saw was our, you know, kind of perfect life and marriage and all that. Um, and and so I did. And um, until it got to a point where, you know, Anthony is somebody as an addict. And now I've met a lot of women who've been with addicts or are with addicts. He had to lose everything. He had to lose everything. Yeah. In order to realize he needed to be in deep, deep recovery, active recovery, be in a program, have a support group. But he, we, we had to lose everything yeah. for that to happen. And that's what addiction is. And yeah. the fact that you shared that, and as you said earlier, that, that so many women come up to you yeah. is because it's true. Marriage is complex and challenging. Yeah. And, you know, I think in this world of the perfect social media storm, everyone mm-hmm. looks like they have it all. But anyone who's been in a marriage knows that you have ups and downs yeah. every day. Yeah. And sometimes, as my mother once told me, who's been married to my dad for over 50 years, she's like, you have good years sometimes in a long marriage and, and bad years. But at some point, you choose yes to stay or go based on what you want for your own life. And that is the key always. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I I don't know where you lived in the Flatiron around the same time that you had your your son, but there was a place called Apple Seeds that yeah, you may remember. Very well. And our children, you wouldn't have known this, but I knew this, our children took a class together. Oh, wow. Because I remember coming in, now that you're talking about this, I remember mm. coming in and it was in the, the middle of the the middle of something that had just happened or blown mm. up. And your ex-husband was, was there with your son. And... I remember saying to my husband afterwards, you know, it's so interesting living in New York where you are exposed and you meet people at all Mm -hmm. levels of success at all levels of power who are put on the cover of the New York Post and their lives are parodied. And you know these people, you get to know them as friends. And I remember thinking, God, the fact that he came here with his son and he's still out and about And they're dealing with so much stuff. Mm. And I saw you guys walking down the street one together and thinking to myself, like, we're the same age. We have a child the same age. Like, I have so much admiration for the fact that you got out of bed every day and you continue to live your life when I'm sure that there were days when you wanted to crawl into a ball and hide. And I wonder if you could even share, because I know people are asking you on the street and hopefully... This will get out to a larger <laughs> audience than maybe one person. But I do, would, I would love for you to just share anything you did to cope during those times because yeah. people are not going to have the experience you've had, but people mm. have small experiences yeah. over time that blow their confidence or that make them feel really small. Yeah. I would love to know anything that you did or anything you can say that during that time that helped you through. You know, the partner, um, the, the point that you made about the partnership, I mean, that was something we were committed to from day one, which is our, you know, as much as we could have a normal childhood and life for our son, yeah. um, we would do that. And, and Anthony was always a very present parent and I was always the one traveling, um, you know, whether it was for a campaign or for work. But we have that dynamic actually in our marriage. I know you I do. travel a ton. I know and you I fully, do. I, I fully understand that, and uh, it, it does do. take a it takes a willing partner, especially when the travel is bad. Absolutely, and and it makes all the difference. I mean, yeah. it just it's makes or breaks in some ways. And there were plenty of days where it was very hard for me to crawl out of bed. It helped to have a job that was very demanding. Yeah. One of the things that I did. Um, which I'm not sure was the best for me, but I, I was I was good at compartmentalizing. It mm-hmm. was 
I would come home and have these sort of maddening conversations with Anthony about like, I don't understand what's wrong. And he would say like, what's wrong? Oh my gosh, you, you should go see somebody for your anger <laughs> issues, you know, right. which is something, you know, <laughs> of addicts, course, addicts a, a, if Anthony yeah. was here, he would say this. He was like, he was very good at deflecting. It's like, I'm okay. Are you okay? <laughs> like, wait, am I the one not okay? Yeah. Um, talk to any woman in a relationship with an addict of any kind, they'll, they'll, they'll be nodding, but, uh, or any huge person. I, I, I hate that I'm gendering this, but I can only talk about it. Yeah. You know, from my about your experience, <laughs> truly. Um, but on days that I struggled to get out of bed, he always did. I mean, he really made it, you know, his part of his sort of service. Um, and he even says this now, even though he's moved on with his life and, you know, he's, you know, and he's doing well, he'll say, I will always be in service to you and Jordan because it's, you know, I owe this to yeah. you. But he also just loves um, being with his son. And, um I also always tell women to not, you know, so so because I was able to get up every day and say, okay, I'm now going to Iraq and we got to figure this out. I could shut off that part. I could shut off Anthony. I could shut off the the unpleasantness. Um, and I think it 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 made the anger and the resentment and the seething mm -hmm. just simmer. Yeah. And so I would have. I mean, he's right. I mean, I would have these angry outbursts at the time, and that's something I actively had to work on. To us to get into like deep therapy to work on. But I, I always tell people feel everything. Yes. Don't, don't just hold it. Cause by the way, you're going to wake up one day and you're 45. Yeah. And if you want, especially women who will say that I'm just waiting to see if I'm going to have children with him. Okay. Let me just tell you something else. That is also not a forever thing. Yeah. So that in the end, uh, you know, we often end up codependent in these relationships Stay on your side of the street. Just keep your side of the street clean. Yeah. Take care of yourself and yes. your children. Do the best you can to help your partner. But at the end of the day, if they're not prepared to do the work, you can't allow yourself. And I almost did. I almost, I mean, I, I fell into a deep depression after a period of time. And so I always say to women, just be selfish. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Um, and... For some people, it's the right decision to stay. And for some people, it's the right decision to go. Don't listen to anybody else. Don't listen Only to anyone else. listen to what, you know, is in your heart and your head, which is what I did. And I, you know, that part I don't regret. I, I should have acted earlier. That sooner is the only thing. If I could go back yeah. is done something. But a lot of experts say to me, you couldn't have, you know, you couldn't have forced him to realize what was wrong with him. And... Don't forget, hindsight is twenty twenty. So isn't that yes. a wonderful thing to be able to look yes. back and say, I should have. But yeah. you lived through it. Mm. You made it through the other side. Mm. At what point, and actually, this is kind of a question that would sum up a lot of what we've discussed today. At what point in your life did you realize that you had chosen a candidate in your life, in your history in the, the world that you were living in, who was going to possibly become the president of the United States. Like at what point in serving with Hillary Clinton, at what point in your marriage are you at this point? Are you divorced? Are you? We were still, um, so when Anthony, uh, sorry, when Hillary ran for president in 2014, uh, the conversations had started and, I, and uh, I talk about this so rarely, but there, I do write about it. Um, you know, Anthony ran for, uh, you know, had to resign from Congress in 2011. Uh, we'd gotten married in 2010, so we weren't even married a year before everything kind of fell apart, but we stayed together. And I, I share, and this is something that a lot of women um, do come up uh, to and talk about. I share what it was like, and I have an old chapter called, as you know, Elephant in the Room, right. Shame, Shame, Go Away. Yes. We live with so much shame. We live, you know, with feeling as though we are constantly judged by the people in our lives. Um, but I... I stayed the course, you know, I sort of had, you know, confidence in who I was and, you know, believed that I was doing the right thing and didn't let, you know, myself be bullied by other people. And um, he ran for Congress, in, uh, sorry, mayor in 2013. That was a disaster. Um, and so when Hillary was talking about running for president in 2016, I was actually not sure, you know, my, my personal life was a mess. Yeah. I was deeply unhappy in my marriage. Anthony had not really been, not, not really, he'd not been, he had not been diagnosed as having an addiction, even at that point, yeah. professionally diagnosed. Well, whatever, I have this whole theory that I think a lot of very, that high profile people are celebrities who go in for therapy, often get VIP therapy. So they go and say, well, I'm good. Yeah. Well, this is what I believe. And they're like, okay, you're good. As opposed to, no, there's something like really wrong with you. And that had not happened for us. You know, Anthony would, mm -hmm. I, I felt like he would run our therapy sessions. 
but she asked me to serve. Said, you know, she decided to run and she asked me to do the campaign and I was offered a really big job and I thought, okay, well, Anthony's a stay-at-home dad and he'll take care of Jordan. And I actually share the story about this going to uh, Morocco for New Year's and I knew, and Hillary had gone away with her family to make the final decision about what she, whether she was going to run. I've never talked about this uh, in January of, uh, it was 2015. Uh, and that was going to be the final decision. And I remember t- like going out to dinner with him at this fancy French restaurant where I'm all dressed up and I'm sitting across the table from him and thinking, I'm really unhappy. I'm really unhappy in this marriage. Like I don't, it's not giving me, even though you give me so many things, I'm not happy. Yeah. And it was the first time I said to him, I, I, I'm not sure I can stay in this marriage. Like I want to, and I, I think I even used the word, I think I want to get divorced or separated. I don't remember specifically, but we were like, let's get through, okay, let's get through the campaign. Let's figure, a, a, another thing a lot of couples I have since heard do, it's like, okay, let's stay in the same apartment. He basically moved upstairs. I moved downstairs. We lived in this, you know, uh, you know, two, you know, two small apartments on top of each other. And it worked. It's not by no means perfect. Um, and that's how he we went through the campaign. And then it was during the presidential campaign that he really uh, kind of exploded. I mean, it was really, that was... Uh, what led to the investigation. I mean, his interaction with an underage woman um, that essentially started the investigation that led to his complete unraveling. And so you're in the middle of this presidential Mm. campaign and you are firing on all cylinders professionally. And that was, I mean, the most watched campaign. Everybody was galvanized. The country was galvanized and on pins and needles on both sides, depending on what you wanted at that point. And your entire personal life is imploding at the Mm. same time. And again, going back to that confidence piece, and I think this is really something that you see throughout your life where you are just going through things one after another and just building up reserves. Yes. Like you must have just been at that point when you're, you know, with Hillary Clinton, you're traveling around the world. I'm sure that that is, I mean, what is it like to be on a presidential campaign anyway? Is it just relentless? It's relentless. It's, it's insanity. Relentless. And, you know, I, look, I had a very strong community of, of support, but I also had my faith. You know, yeah. I do talk about this you do. in the you book, talk about but on that the really, it was just receding into a corner and just making like a, a reflection, a prayer. I mean, a meditation, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that singular conversation between yourself and a higher power just to get you through another day. And that was a core part of how I got through a lot of the very, very, you know, worst days. And during the campaign, my goodness, were there a lot. Yeah, especially that last day. I mean, we all watched, the world watched, and it was not what anyone thought was going to happen. What does that look like on the backside? And you're actually seeing your hero, as you've said many times, the person you respect and look up to more than anyone, is now having to claim her confidence because everything that she's worked for her whole life is now gone yeah. overnight. Yeah. So what does that look like? And what does that feel like? It was, I mean, the thing that was most stunning, but also not surprised, stunning to everybody, but not surprising to me at all is, you know, by the time we got to election day, because of the FBI announcement, Comey announcing 10 days before the election, that they were reopening this closed email uh, investigation mm-hmm. because of some new emails that they found on Anthony's laptop that they was a separate, whole separate investigation. And so they did something unprecedented. And then instead of calling our lawyers and saying, hey, we found some, uh, you know, of Huma's emails on Anthony's laptop, they make this public announcement. And it just sort of, you know, so close to election day and yeah. an election this close. It was such an earth shattering. And, uh, you know, I believed from that day that there was no way we were going to win. There was just no way. Really? From that oh, day? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That there, it was just how, when it, how would you overcome this? And going back to, you know, headquarters and, you know, the the man who ran our analytics program kind of saying, you know, he was really worried. I mean, he was seeing the numbers kind of numbers where we needed in places really very much tighten. Um, and so when two days before the Sunday before the Tuesday of Election Day to then have a second announcement saying, oh, nothing to see. We looked at everything. It's all these are all copies. There's nothing to see here. It really got the other side riled up because for two years to hear that the election was going to be rigged, which is what her opponent was saying and now he was able to say to see I told you it was rigged they've you know they've cleaned it all up so that Hillary could win and so it really shifted those 77,000 but that we needed yeah you know in those crucial states in his direction so that moment I mean I really just think about I I, I couldn't even I couldn't feel 
I can't imagine. I mean, you must in have been that numb. bathroom after uh, the alignment, I was just like, yeah. I mean, it was just like I, I didn't, I didn't feel entitled to feel. And so we stayed up all night. She gets up the next morning and she delivers this really stunning, like just beautiful concession speech. And uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, her concession speech showed why she would have been an extraordinary president because she showed number one, her love of country. People have spoken, even though people were, you know, we had campaign operatives calling from around the country saying, don't concede. There's enough uncertainty in these numbers in, in, in certain places in certain states. We should, you know, ask for a recount here or we should ask for, you know, some more numbers to come in. And she said, no, I'm not going to allow, you know, any kind of uncertainty. I believe in, you know, our electoral process. And she conceded and she did it with such grace. And when she called Trump to concede, she said the hardest thing, which is basically, look, I know we don't agree on a lot of things, but I'm going to support our sitting president. And wow, I mean, that to do all of that in the space of, you know, an hour. I mean, she called almost immediately after, you know, we'd made a deal with the Trump campaign that as soon as the AP called the election for whoever, we would accept whoever the, you know, Associated Press had determined had won the election. And, and she did. I mean, she just was so, and she walks off stage, delivers a concession speech. And the last thing she says to me before she gets in her car to go home was, I have to figure out how to get jobs for all these people on her campaign. I mean, even then, it's... This, if there's ever a moment, it should be about you, that you go home, put a bag on your head. It's now, and her last thing to me is, I have to figure out how to help all these people get jobs. It's so funny when you started this interview, how you said that you always thought you were going to live an extraordinary life. Yeah. And look at that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just an incredible story, Huma, to hear even the beginning all the way to present day. And one thing I heard you say in an interview that really struck me, and I, I... tell you, and you can tell me if I'm saying this correctly, you for so long were the invisible person behind mm-hmm. the primary people in your life. But what you didn't realize is, is if you don't tell your story, someone else is writing your history. And I yeah. love that you've taken ownership of this. I love that you've written this book. I thank you for your candor and your candidness in this conversation, because there are so many things I know people shy away from in their lives mm-hmm. because they feel, as you said, shame or they feel something that it's something that they shouldn't share. And it's only when we share things like this that people realize that to get through all of this is ultimately what makes you confident Mm -hmm. and allows you to live whatever life you want free of shame and of other people's opinion. So what are you doing now? What what comes next for you? Well, this has been an, a, a year I could not even have possibly imagined. And so I, I've, I've learned so many, first of all, I've learned so many things about myself, number one, as somebody who like, as you said, like to be an invisible person, which I do like to be. But I, <laughs> I don't find think that, you should be. I think I, you're a compelling no, but, person. I get to hear and listen to you all day. But I, and likewise, um, but I, um, uh, with you, but I, I feel as though I do enjoy, like now that I'm out in the world, I like uh, having a seat at the table. I like helping women in particular. I'm really excited to be working on this mentorship conference with Mika Brzezinski um, mm-hmm. and her foundation, Know, know Your Value. And, co-sponsoring it with Forbes and so actively working on putting this conference together for International Women's Day, which is taking up a lot of time, which I'm very excited about. We uh, Hillary has started a production company and we've got a few, sh- one um, documentary about uh, an Afghan woman mayor uh, called in, uh, uh, in Her Hands is out. And so we've, we're sort of moving into the creative space uh, and really enjoying it. Maybe I'll do some more writing and maybe I'll do a little bit more TV, but I'm I'm really in that time in my life where I'm, open to all kinds of new possibilities. And you mentioned at dinner that there is one exciting opportunity that has come as well. Well, well, okay, well. Oh, oh yeah, wait, I was forgot. I not allowed to say that? No, no, but it's on Netflix. <laughs> Sorry. That's, I, I, no, you should have said this, Mark. <laughs> okay. And I should have actually led with this. No, that my book has been optioned um, by Frida Pinto. Thank you for reminding yes, me. Of I, actually I thought that, that that was such an exciting it's part so of it. so exciting. And it's, I'm really, really, because I think a lot of people, you know, who won't read the book, would watch the show but, but you should read the book uh, read the book it's so yes good. i hope people read the book too <laughs> but um so frida pinto has optioned the book and it's going to be a limited series and she has a first look uh, deal with the uh, e1 the production company and so we're in the process of 
you know, write doing writing a, a script, and we're hoping to sell it. It's not with any streaming service or anywhere yet, but well, Netflix we're working as on a, it. I'm just maybe I'm <laughs> making that happen for you. <laughs> Netflix's ears. <laughs> Love it. Well, I will definitely be watching. And then, where can we find you? Are you active on social media? I am keep us all updated. I am on Instagram, and I'm a little bit on Twitter. Um, and you'll see me on MSNBC because I've been doing a little contributing there too. So I'm going to be, I'm, gonna, I'm looking forward to this holiday break, but I'll, I'll be back out in the world. Well, there is no doubt that you have found your voice and are using it for so much good. So thank you for being here today. I've loved speaking with you and hearing everything about your life and everything that's upcoming. And I'm cheering for you. I have really enjoyed meeting you and loved having you on here, obviously. Um, I want to thank all of my listeners for tuning in again this week for Claim Your Confidence. You can follow along on Lydia Finette at Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, where I'll be posting updates about upcoming guests. I also podcast live out of the lobby of One Rockefeller Plaza in a glass front podcast booth, which Huma's seen because people are coming by and waving and taking pictures of her as she sits here. A special thanks to Newsstand Studios and Rockefeller Center, and of course, the amazing Joe, who keeps everything running behind the scenes. And I want to leave you all with one thought. If over the course of your life, you've had something that you've felt was going to completely flatten you and you couldn't get through it, send me a DM and tell me what that was and tell me how you kept going. And I can share that with other people as well. Uma, thank you again for being here today. I look forward to seeing everyone next week, or I look forward to speaking with everyone next week. 